So welcome back everybody. Um, some technical information. So YP, uh, Vera Yurova will be half an hour late. So she will join us at uh, 2.55 instead of 2.30. So uh, if you agree, we can have another 20 minutes break at half past two. Uh, in the meanwhile, there will be anyway, uh, two presentations by Professor Parkman, and then uh, I will also uh, present something. Um, so that's uh, especially from our friends online. Um, we apologize uh, for the delay. We hope it will be fine for you to have uh, another coffee break in the meanwhile. Um, and now the, um, Professor Parku will um, speak about um, so the digital threats to media pluralism. So new risks um, that uh, we encounter in the digital environment and that of course, in the context of the MPM are very important to uh, keep under careful consideration for the next implementations as well. Okay, thank you, Sophia. Uh, well, uh, this is just an introduction uh, to the to this afternoon discussion. We will discuss uh, a little bit. The title of the session is "The Future of Media Pluralism." Uh, I will take it uh, from the angle of uh, the fact that we are in the digital age and we are uh, we have some of the old risks plus uh, we have new ones. Uh, let's have a, a and I will not. Uh, talk too much. Uh, setting the scene, uh, we let's start from the uh, where the legacy media are. Then we know that uh, there are not only the legacy media, but there are also new medias, digital media. There is a, an environment that is changing. But if you look at the scene by, from the point of view of the legacy media, clearly they've been impacted by a series of different uh, pressure. Uh, one on you can see on the, le on the le left uh, high uh, the importance of the networks, the fact that uh, the networks have changed the way in which uh, news and information are distributed has been, uh, have created a, a situation in which uh, uh, while before the distribution of the news was through newspapers, uh, the press or uh, television, uh, somehow the uh, digital economy has created a situation in which uh, uh, the network and especially internet has become the major, uh, the major uh, channel for, uh, for the information or a major channel for information. On the other end, on this other side, you have the platforms that have created out of this uh, incredible distribution, the uh, growth of new networks, have created a, a new business models, uh, very competitive uh, also toward the media, competitive in, in many dimensions, but extremely competitive for the legacy media. Uh, then also, uh, the legacy media have been impacted by the innovation, the fact that all this, uh, the, the action, the new networks, the platforms have created, change, have changed the way in which not only news are distributed, but also are consumed by citizens. So this uh, uh, different spreading of information. Also, if you want an information overload in a certain way, then the question is the quality has changed what the, their product, the news was, and also especially how that product could be sold. And this has created another attention. And also uh, clearly uh, the legacy media have been impacted in all this change by the fact that there were a series of rights, privacy, freedom of enterprise, freedom of expression, pluralism that were all impacted by this uh, transformation. So this is the scene that we see, a legacy media in uh, deep difficulties and then the necessity also of uh, seeing new ways to uh, create content. Uh, let's uh, stay a second on the platform because in, in the end of these four challenges, the platform in very soon has become the most 
important challenge for the media. Uh, platforms, as we know, are characterized by the fact that they are multi-sided market, they operate among the different group of agents. They are based essentially, from an economic point of view, from the exploitation of these indirect network externalities, the fact that they are able to use uh, the fact that different groups have different uh, necessity, but in relation among themselves uh, to uh, increase the benefit of each group. I will come uh, better in a second. And also they are exploit the fact that uh, these groups cannot internalize these externalities without having a platform in the middle. So the platform have invented a new way to exploit this important network externality. I will come to this. Uh, the other element that uh, came out of this world is the fact that uh, because these network externalities are a, a very powerful multiplier of richness and of uh, resources, it has become a world of winners take all or winners takes most dynamics in which few platforms in the end dominate this kind of world of the externalities. And in fact, we have seen this also this morning in the results of the online advertising distribution that is essential in the hands of three global players. Um, so network effect can create, as was said by some economists, uh, value, great value very rapidly, but uh, they can also destroy uh, value as, uh, as fast as they do. Uh, so, uh, and plus uh, we have this element because of the winner stakeholder dynamic for which this platform tends to have a competition primarily for the market. They get to the market. There is no competition in the market are we, are we were used anymore. Once the leader is there, it's very difficult to displace. And the media, the legacy media, weren't used to this. They lived in a world in which, yes, there could be leaders, but these leaders could be contrasted, displaced, and so on, because these leaders had a certain advantage, but not advantage so entrenched as the one that the major platform are showing at this moment. Uh, the fact that this platform have these advantages is somehow cumulative because once you are when you have a winner stakeholder dynamic, once you have got the market, then you can defend it in many ways. One interesting way in which platforms defend their markets is by acquisition. So we see, uh, for instance, here there is an example of Meta's acquisition that uh, uh, Meta can uh, acquire things like uh, WhatsApp because uh, WhatsApp could, could have become a problem for Facebook at some point and they acquired it uh, at a very high price, but uh, still. And so WhatsApp remains something different from Facebook, but somehow as uh, somebody has said that there is a theory of the moat they, are, they defend the border, in a sense, of uh, Facebook in one way or another. Then they have new ideas. Oculus is a buy for something different. In fact, Meta, Facebook has become Meta and is looking at the, at the virtual reality and so on. That's another. That's probably, if you want, more virtuous than other. That's not defensive. Probably that's expansive. But then, you see, they buy everything... Uh, they feel could be useful or could be threatening. And they have two elements for doing this. They have the money, the liquidity, and the knowledge, because they buy also the, the right people. There is a, one theory is a, that they do uh, acquire hiring. If you have a startup uh, in the area of five, 10 millions, uh, and you, with a good idea, they buy the startup just to hire the person. That's a dynamic that is in all the major, uh, all the major platforms. Uh, this is not only Meta, obviously I showed Meta here, but you can see you know, this is smaller to be seen, but anyway, this is Alphabet, uh, Microsoft and Amazon. And you can see the, their acquisition in the last uh, few years and the, um, and the volume of uh, amount of money they spent in this acquisition. These are things that uh, no media could do, could even conceive. They are uh, 
it's, it's, a, it's another world, another economic dimension, another. Uh, and so this is the, and this uh, unfortunately has become the competitors of this, uh, in some way of this uh, media. Um, what, one word more about the dynamic. Uh, the media somehow were one model that could understand the business model of platforms because the media were, uh, if you want, uh, a multimedia market before economists uh, designed the definition because a newspaper has always been based on the idea that uh, you have two groups, advertiser and, and, and readers or a, tele, or a or a pay television uh, that has, a, a, sorry, a free air television that is financed by advertising is always being based on the two groups, on the interaction among the two groups and the indirect network externality. The idea that uh, the more viewers are there, the more advertisers are happy and the more they pay. So this is the normal model on which the traditional media were based. Media were based on this idea, newspaper and a free, a free to air television in particular, were based on the idea that advertiser would pay for the attention of this viewer. It was an indirect network externality. Why this is different from what the uh, platforms are doing? Uh, well, it's different because platforms have managed to, for instance, here is an example of a social network platform. Platforms have managed to multiply this thing in many ways. So you have all the indirect externality, all the direct externality. Uh, if you have a major social network, uh, content providers want to be able to access it. So you see why, because there are a lot of users, but advertisers are very happy that uh, uh, there are a lot of users and there are a lot of content because more content, more users. So you see, there is a, a multiplying dimension of this that wasn't in the uh, traditional media. The, the media were a sort of a skeleton of this design and this design has exploded with the platforms. Also uh, adding to indirect network externality, also direct network externality, because if you think there are platforms that improve because they have more users, not only advertisers are happy that there are more users, but even more users are happy that there are more users. Why? Think to Google. Google improves all, all the time we ask a question. So the algorithm is better anytime we ask something to the algorithm. So you see this incredible potential that has been unleashed by the platform business model and by the technology that is on which these are based, even if each of them, the social network or, or the search, or the e-commerce platforms are different, but the, the, economic, the deep economic dynamic is somehow similar, is an incredible challenge for uh, the traditional media. And this has brought a disruption in many other industries, but especially on the media industry. Uh, what are the four elements of the disruption if we can uh, try to identify them? Well, the first is the separation from information to the physical media. You don't need anymore the newspaper uh, or even the television because you have all the information moving through internet. So uh, somehow you have a non-rivalry of the digital goods. It's difficult to sell. In, in easier word, it's difficult to sell anymore because it's difficult to exclude anybody, okay? Uh, then you have jeopardized the uh, price, pricing decision. You, were, you had the price for the newspaper, for the, for the subscription of television or whatever, or, or even for the television advertising. But, in the, but if you don't manage anymore to price the, your, your information, uh, even if, if this information is priced in different ways because Google or Facebook don't price to the consumer. They have different metrics. We are studying these metrics, understanding the data value and so on. But anyway, they are different from the pricing that the normal media used to do. Then another element that is clearly an element of progress in a sense, but again, is a problem. Marginal cost of storing, processing and distributing information is gone to zero. So you see, this is also an element that in theory is very positive also for media, 
but in reality it becomes a, 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 a real problem. And then there has been a, a general reduction cost of all the, the transaction cost in all the economic change that is also part of this. If we look at the uh, effect on the traditional media, on the legacy media, well, the effect is that this has attacked the two pillars, both the sales to readers and viewers and the advertising revenue. So both pillars have been put in jeopardy. Digital advertising is now uh, in the US more than two thirds of the advertising market spent, uh, very quickly growing. Uh, digital advertising, as we said, and also as Roberta said this morning, is dominated by very few companies. And so it's extremely concentrated. Uh, and look at the fact I, I show this, uh, um, this is the share of uh, information um, is one side of the two pillars. No? The share of information re uh, reading, I don't know if I well, share of, uh, yes, if, yeah, but it's about uh, circulation, let's say selling uh, newspapers from 36, 37% to 21 in a few years. That means you have uh, after the, your ability to sell news. And this is a trend that uh, you see also the COVID doesn't affect much. It's a, it's a very strong trend. And then if you look at uh, uh, advertising, that was very, very important also, probably more important for many, many newspapers and many televisions. Look what happened to advertising. I like to show this thing uh, because it makes it very plastic. You, you have on the, on the left side, the um, uh, New York Times. New York Times had a, like a 15 years ago, and uh, in, let's say in, te, in 15 years has lost like 77% of its advertising revenue. So it went from 2 billion and something to half a, mil, half a billion now. And we are talking about the New York Times. So we are talking, we are not talking of, uh, I don't want to make names. We are talking probably of the most important, most well-known, most important richer uh, newspaper in the world has lost 70% of its advertising revenue. It has managed to survive on circulation. The circulation is more or less okay. So while other newspapers have lost a lot of the circulation, the ones that are still open, but uh, you see 77% of uh, the advertising revenue is uh, really disastrous for a, for a business. Uh, in the same time, in the same 12 years, uh, Facebook has moved from uh, an advertising that was uh, one third of the New York Times to 118 billions. That means that has grown the 15,000 percent in these 13 years. And uh, that's, the, that's the challenge, okay? At least this is the economic challenge. Then there is the technological challenge that we were mentioning before, the fact that News are all over, distributed all over. Uh, their quality is uh, debatable. Part of them are pieces of content created by the, the traditional media, that by new digital media that are really media. But anyway, news have become a flow in which we are all somehow inside without being able for who produces the news to really uh, price them or sell them. So this is the reality. Um, what are the means to alternative means to react to finance this with the possible answers? And this is the, for the discussion uh, here. Well, uh, external sources, uh, make a platform pay. That's clearly the attempt that uh, the copyright directive in Europe is, is doing. What is doing, or, or in other countries, in Australia, in other areas, there has been attempt of this kind. The idea is uh, because uh, platform use the content created by media, created by journalists, they should pay for it. So let's make agreements for paying. It's a way, we'll see the, if in the end will result, will give a result. The, the other is a parallel way, different. Uh, we should 
have, uh, we, if we judge that news, quality news, investigative journalism is a merit good, and the market is not producing anymore enough because it's a merit good because it has a, a value for the society, it's an externality for the society that can help the society more than what is valued for the, each private consumption, then it should be supported. And that's the idea for a public support to, uh, that could be at the regional level or at the national level. Then there are all the questions of uh, political influence that need to be dealt with. That's why region, uh, regional level, the EU level for the countries or the uh, national level for lo very local news could be a partial solution to this conf potential conflict of interest that is very serious. But anyway, the issue is this. This could be other ways, external sources for finding a new model. Or the alternative is new business model for the media industry. And new business model uh, are explored. We have a premium, uh, uh, so very high quality production of news that can really still get a price even in this world. In this digital world, uh, freemium, the combination of the two, something for free, but uh, they are the deeper things for, uh, for a payment, uh, subscription, membership, uh, crowdfunding, contributions, philanthropy. These are all other possibilities. Uh, and they're explored. The problem is that for the moment, they don't look sufficient. So it looks like we don't have yet a solution for this uh, for this challenge. So, uh, conclusion: the business model of platforms, all the pressure I, I mentioned at the beginning, but essentially the business model of platforms have changed the game for the media. The internet, uh, the platform success, have deprived the media industry of most from most of its revenue, advertising or paid by readers. So, both the pillars are crumbling or crumbled. Uh, the search for alternative uh, means of financing for news and journalism is very important because journalism is very important and quality content is very important for democracy, but the solution is still to be found. So we are in the middle of this challenge. That's uh, my introduction to this thing. Okay. Okay, because now we see the slides there, of course. Thanks, Pierluigi. So uh, I will try to be very short. It's a uh, change presentation. So I will just briefly speak about um, position paper that we as CMPF uh, wrote for the public consultation that was open um, uh, last January on the European Media Freedom Act. So as you um, might know, last year at the 2021 State of the Union, uh, President von der Leyen announced that the European Union um, had the will to uh, enact this new act, the European Media Freedom Act. And they gave some preliminary um, guidelines of what they have in mind with, the, uh, with this new act uh, uh, while opening a public consultation last January. And so we put, la we put down a sort of wish list of things that we believe that based on our researches should be uh, included in this act that uh, we very welcome uh, as we believe that uh, 
uh, it were it was many years that um, a similar act uh, was expected in the European Union since we have had of course the audiovisual media services directive, uh, uh, the GDPR, uh, the copyright directive. So uh, acts that and regulations that tackle the media environment from different points of view, but this might be the chance to have a more comprehensive uh, regulation uh, within the European Union. Um, these proposals uh, were also based on this other study that uh, Pierluigi mentioned this morning, CMPF has run this year, the study on media plurality and diversity online that will be published uh, most probably in half of July. And I will be happy to share it with all of you and some of uh, the researchers uh, in this room also contributed uh, to this study. So um, one uh, of the areas, let's say, uh, of course, the macro area that we expect that to be uh, addressed by the Media Freedom Act is uh, regards safeguarding media pluralism. And we believe that uh, the European Media Freedom Act should do that, taking into account and recalling the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and the European uh, Court of Justice and the related standards that have been developed in these years, but also um, the work that has been done by the Council of Europe in these years might be really informative to this new act. Uh, so in this regard, we believe that one really crucial thing that we would like to see uh, drafted in the legislative proposals is general European definition of media for the digital era. So uh, we believe that this is uh, crucial for, for like kind of preliminary for any kind of policy in this field. Um, and with that, uh, we uh, mean to include um, all the actors that uh, have um, are holders of a public opinion forming power. So not only uh, uh, online media, for example, of course, legacy media as we know them, but also not only online media as online news websites, uh, but also other media actors like very influential bloggers or uh, intermediary services as uh, social media platforms. Of course, differentiating the level of rights and duties that these actors would have. So um, graduating proportionally which kind of um, uh, what is expected from them, of course. Uh, secondly, another definition is needed in our opinion, which is the definition of what we mean by media pluralism, um, which we can't really find uh, up to now in, in the European or most of the member states regulations. Um, by that meaning a definition that includes uh, uh, an holistic uh, assessment of external and internal aspects of media pluralism considerations. This will be um, consequently very important for this proposal that already other colleagues of mine today have put forward. This idea of having a media pluralism test, especially in the context of uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions between media companies. Uh, I will speak about that later better of uh, what, what we uh, mean by that. Um, but of course, it, it is something that uh, uh, intrinsically needs a definition of what is meant by media pluralism for testing it. Um, and then also in terms of definition, um, what, clarifying the meaning of what is meant by general interest content would also re be really important. Uh, as you know, this definition is already included in the audiovisual media services directive, but um, it is uh, pretty vague still, and uh, that allows for very differentiated implementations in the different uh, member states. Um, second area of high interest uh, for, for this act would be to implement the state of uh, transparency and independence for the media market. So 
Uh, we have already spoken about that this morning, Roberta uh, especially tackled this point. And so, of course, we know uh, the availability and accessibility to comprehensive and accurate data on media markets is crucial, both for uh, recognizing, recognizing when abuses of media power are in place to allow citizens to choose freely uh, to be aware of the potential bias of the news that they consume, uh, and also for regulators themselves to enact um, safe um, provisions. Um, and um, yeah, so in, in this sense, um, we believe that it will be really important to establish cross-country databases and repositories of, of data. So going back to, to, of course, the point of our um, interest today, the NPM uh, project. Uh, for example, as you know, we ask for data on the top four players. Um, this year, we have uh, tried to compare this data for this other project uh, I was mentioning. And it was really hard to do that because uh, top four in, in the different countries are measured using different metrics revenues, audience, uh, and so on. Um, and so it is really hard to have a comprehensive overview of who is really powerful in a context compared to another context. And since uh, it is great to have comparability tools, uh, establishes common metrics and cross-country databases would be ideal in this sense. Um, so for that, of course, uh, it would be uh, important to establish common standards on data gathering uh, to facilitate data sharing obligations, both between media actors themselves, as we know, especially digital intermediaries are not really open to share their data in non-aggregated forms with other actors. Uh, but also between uh, authorities, of course, that collect this data. So media authorities, data protection authorities, and so on. Um, with regard to media ownership information, then again, on the same line, uh, it would be great to require the same amount and type of media ownership information to different, these different range of, of media actors that we were listing before. Uh, and to guarantee that it is, this is openly accessible to citizens as well as to authorities. Um, for example, uh, okay, for example, we have time later if we want to go deeper in the case, uh, country case studies. Um, and uh, of course, also this transparency should involve uh, public subsidies, direct and indirect subsidies and uh, information on, on their allocation. But all of this uh, big list of wishes, uh, of course, would be um, vain uh, without adequate monitoring. So it is really important to envisage an effective um, mechanism of monitoring of these uh, eventual obligations. Um, on a third area of, of, of interest and really related, of course, uh, relates to the conditions for healthy media markets. So we have already widely spoken about issues for uh, the economic safety of, of journalists, uh, about the underfinancing of journalism, uh, about concentration of market power in the hands of certain um, actors. Um, and our ideas, we have already also went, we have gone through some of them uh, this morning, relate to a EU fund for media pluralism. In this regard, we believe that having a supranational fund would um, may avoid uh, and reduce the risk at least of political pressures at the national and at the local level, uh, because something that we found in our research is that sometimes in the smaller the context the higher it could be the pressure of course um, 
And one idea that came to our mind is that um, a, a, a nice scheme to follow could be the one of uh, Creative Europe and, um, and the funds that are uh, provided for support to the European cinema. So uh, to finance uh, independent and original journalistic programs uh, following or introducing them within the already existing Creative Europe program might be uh, away. Um, then, um, uh, with regard to the economic safety of journalists, we had plenty of interventions this morning on, on this point. And of course, it would be um, um, expectable that the European Media Freedom Act tackles issues uh, uh, for a uh, equal social protection for journalists and freelancers, especially across Europe. Um, we imagine that uh, a European insurance for um, cases of slaps uh, might be um, of help uh, for, for overcoming cases of you know, economic disparity in, in, in uh, um, going over a, a trial for journalists. Um, and also support schemes for those that are fired for political or economic reasons. So going back to this idea of the media pluralism test, uh, we um, uh, believe that in case of, of, uh, of um, mergers and acquisitions between media companies, um, um, higher um, let's say, uh, new powers to media authorities or anyway, higher considerations for media pluralism uh, issues should um, enter uh, the scene. Uh, we know that um, mergers are mainly managed by competition authorities. Most of the times they don't have um, the remit or it is not uh, in their objectives to, to take into account media pluralism considerations when they evaluate the, the possibility to accept a merger. Uh, so we would suggest to uh, introduce a kind of test that also takes into account what will be the consequences in terms of internal pluralism and of exposure diversity following that, that merger. Um, and on this point, we really welcome ideas uh, because um, uh, th th this might be a controversial point uh, for, for um, you know, the balancing of powers between authorities. Um, with regard to the um, uh, market power generated by data in, in the media market, um, the Media Freedom Act uh, should be in line with the provisions in, in the Digital Markets Act. So uh, regarding also the online uh, advertising market, um, so in this case, we are speaking about uh, data sharing obligations, the possibility of making data accessible also for smaller media, and to introduce some limits for targeted uh, advertising. Um, and also, finally, uh, Pierluigi was already uh, uh, nicely uh, exposing the possibility for uh, alternative business models, me meaning non-advertising reliant business models for media companies uh, and that support from, from um, uh, the European Union side in this sense, uh, it, it's already taking place, but of course it should be strengthened. Um, with regard to the fair allocation of state resources, also the Media Freedom Act could be a venue for um, improving the situation in this context. So we, by that we mean funding to public service media, indirect and direct subsidies, and um, an improvement in this situation would allow for, you know, leveling the present fragmentation uh, in the fairness of allocation among the different member states um, to try to avoid the political capture that often takes place in this context and also to um, 
design schemes that uh, do not kill the possibility of self-sustainability of media companies. So something that is effective also in the medium long term. Um, uh, so in this sense, uh, we really believe that there should be a virtuous circle between the allocation of state resources and the conditionality for receiving them by media outlets of maintaining certain standards of you know, remuneration for their workers uh, and also transparency obligations for, for these beneficiaries. Um, uh, the direct uh, uh, and indirect subsidies actually we believe are the main way uh, for public financing other than state advertising, uh, which should have instead a different uh, scope than, uh, um, than being um, um, mean for economically sustaining the medium. Um, Again, systems for monitoring and reporting by independent bodies on the transparency as well of the allocation of state resources uh, would be uh, beneficial. Um, and finally, with regard to the public service media remit, um, we found comparing also your uh, your um, data in the in the country reports that. Uh, the situation for the online presence uh, of uh, public service media is, um, is diverse across uh, the European Union, meaning that not always that is or most of the times actually, it is not complete considered part of their public service remit. And so not, there are not the same standards expected in some cases. Um, and of course, more clear guide, guidelines at the European level for independent and neutral appointments procedures for these um, uh, bodies uh, would be welcome. I will conclude with the governance options. Um, we are really like in this exposition following the structure of the public consultation that we filled in. Um, so, yeah, so media authorities are increasingly asked to perform some duties in regulating the media sector. Um, and uh, in order to do that, this should be uh, parallel to an increased demand for their independence and uh, uh, both from economic and political interests. Um, so the remit as well should be modified accordingly. We sometimes they are asked to, to intervene in the digital sector, even if until yesterday they have only been working on audiovisual or the press. So that's, that's crucial to be sure that their expertise and remit are in line with, with the nowadays requests. Um, and since they are asked to expand um, their, their, their competencies on similar issues across the EU, uh, an, uh, an intervention from the EU level then will be welcome. Um, yeah, so as we were saying, in terms of governance, uh, um, increasing the exchange of data and information between authorities would be a really good improvement not only media authorities, but as we were saying, also data protection authorities, competition authorities. And this could be done with the joint committees for institutional cooperation among them. Um, we, um, we imagine that uh, with this media pluralism, the test, there could be a formal obligation for uh, competition authorities to consult the media authorities to assess mergers in the media sectors or other controversial situations in the market in the media sector, believing that media authorities have more competencies in the field. And of course, because of the, this is kind of granted for the people in the room or maybe following online, but 
uh, for, for the crucial role in a democracy of, of the media in respect of other goods in the market. Um, in this sense, um, an idea that also from the European Union's side uh, is, is proposed uh, will be to announce the role of ERGA uh, as a forum to share best practices and discuss problematic issues. Of course, again, this should go hand in hand with um, other ways resources uh, for doing that um, uh, because um, uh, we are aware that uh, um, many um, tasks are, are imagined for, for ERGA in the near future. Um, and finally, but absolutely not the least, um, is that an increased role for um, civil society organizations that deal with free speech and media pluralism issues uh, should be provided. Uh, for example, in the context of um, granting opinions in the context of media mergers. Um, but yes, yeah, sometimes, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, the hear, hearing their voice uh, in, in certain fora is still uh, missing. And um, the most tricky issues, what will be the legal basis for an act like the European Media Freedom Act? So, uh, as you know, uh, often our directives or anyway regulations at the European level um, that uh, wish to harmonize um, certain issues such as media policies, which are not in the ex exclusive competencies of the European Union, are um, br brought forward by using uh, Article 114 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So that's a means legal tool to harmonize um, the European legislations when there is an excessive fragmentation that might endanger the functioning of the single market in Europe. Um, of course, that's a way because the media uh, are a market as well in themselves. Uh, and, and that's most probably the, the way that will be pursued. But we would like also to remark that um, there must be a careful balancing assessment with the, the implication for fundamental rights, because again, these are not common goods uh, like uh, others in the market. Uh, and on this, we would really like to open a discussion with you um, uh, about uh, how that could be imagined or expectable because uh, of course this 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 remark uh, comes from the fact that uh, the legal instruments that are based on the fulfillment on the internal market um, do not uh, systematically address these issues we have seen that uh, uh, in other legal instruments uh, enacted in the past um, so yes, um, thank you for your attention. And um, I think we have some time for, uh, for uh, discussion before uh, connecting. Okay, so we don't need a break actually. Okay, no, yes, we may. Um, have you received a formal acknowledgement from the Commission for your ideas that you submitted on NEFMA? You have? You have. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, as well, in the context of the forum that they had established, but we never got feedback, so I just wanted to know. They yes, but they were also doing an impact assessment. We were also in touch with the people working on the impact assessment. Yes. 
Uh, yes, we have a question from online participants. Raluca Toma asked uh, if uh, is the position paper posted online? It will be. Uh, we are publishing everything today. <laughs> yes, but, um, but anyway, Raluca should have also received that because I, we circulated it before the, today's meeting. The position paper should be on the commission website. It should also be there, yes, but also we shared that via email with the participants today. Thank you. Uh, Josef Seetal from the Austrian team. Uh, I have one wish to the Media Freedom Act. Uh, and if I may, I have one question to Pierluigi. Uh, my wish to the Media Freedom Act. Uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, the media pluralism monitor results, the results from the NPM uh, 2021, uh, uh, were the starting point of a civil society initiative uh, supported by the uh, biggest uh, journalism organization in Austria uh, uh, to amend uh, the PSM law. Uh, uh, particularly the composition uh, of the uh, management board, uh, which uh, is heavily influenced uh, by the government. Uh, so for the first time, uh, the government uh, didn't say no. There are some signs uh, that the government uh, want to talk about it or want to think about it, yeah? Uh, but we are all waiting uh, for the uh, Media Freedom Act uh, to regulate uh, the appointment procedures of management boards uh, of uh, public service media. I'm not sure uh, if this is a realistic uh, wish uh, to the Media Freedom Act. I don't know, maybe uh, you know more. We don't know more, but uh, Vice President Jurova might, and we have 15 minutes of questions with her later on, so this might be a good question <laughs> to do to her. <laughs> okay. Uh, one question to, to Pierre. Uh, uh, Luigi, I, I totally agree with you uh, that the platforms have changed the game. Uh, and among the impacts of the platforms on uh, media industry, you mentioned, uh, the separation uh, from, from physical media. Well, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, uh, it's true, uh, you, you don't need uh, newspapers or TV screens no, anymore to access news. Hmm? Uh, uh, but uh, according to the, the Reuters report, uh, uh, most people are consuming news online uh, via smartphones. And uh, journalists tell me, uh, that they uh, aim uh, to present news in such a way uh, that they fit to this screen, uh, to this small screen, and that they fit to the uh, user habits, how uh, to deal with this uh, smartphone. Uh, so I think this, uh, that there are some uh, impacts uh, from the physical uh, media uh, still in the uh, online uh, Age. Yeah, let me. No, I will. I will answer. But uh, let me come back on the first question that is interesting. Also, uh, can the European Commission uh, decide how uh, PSM uh, are uh, managers or uh, boards are uh, are uh, nominated? Uh, can they can give an indication on this? Well, this is unlikely because. Uh, for instance, for media authority, we know that uh, they are named in very different ways. But uh, so probably cannot really go that way, but can say that this is, if they want in the law, they could say that uh, the system of nomination should be guaranteeing independence from political control and so on. So probably they cannot really mandate how to do it, but they could establish a principle. So that's, and that would be a very good so a step ahead, but important. So let's see if we will have this in the law. 
Uh, no, about to, yes, the second question uh, is more uh, uh, technical. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, the traditional, the legacy instruments are, have been, uh, there has been a split between the physical instrument and the, and the news. So the newspaper and also the television news have been progressively disintermediated. Clearly, there somehow the news they have to arrive. So now we have the smartphone, as before we had the PCs. Clearly, we are using internet for doing this. The instruments will change. The problem is that the instruments of the legacy media have been abandoned. That's what I or abandoned or are declining. And so this change is uh, what you are right. That's exactly what we are discussing, how to do the change. How can adjust uh, the media to this uh, new environment? And uh, Santini is starting, but. Yes, we have another question from Frank Riblar. So Frank, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, Sofia for her presentation because it's not easy to synthesize all the propositions for the for the pluralism and uh, media freedom act. Uh, I had a, a remark concerning the the proposition in in line with the with the DMA because one of the the most important uh, part of the DMA is to uh, make it easier to have interoperability between platforms. And uh, for the instant, uh, the DMA, the DMA, sorry, uh, maintains it only for the messaging platforms. So I would like to, to know if uh, in the, the recommendations that the CMPF will send for, for this new act, uh, that if all the platforms would be, uh, would be uh, exposed to interoperability. I think it is very important. It's a major challenge um because uh, this would be the the opportunity to to break the the market uh, platform uh, dominance and uh, i think this is a very very important uh, stake Yeah, well, I don't think uh, Elda can confirm. Uh, I don't think we speak about interoperability in our uh, recommendation. However, we have started discussing. And uh, personally, I agree that uh, the proposal in the DMA is uh, uh, practically there is only one high level interoperability that is the one you mentioned on messaging, messaging instruments. Uh, however, to go further in interoperability is technically very difficult. And uh, I don't think that this, uh, what is done now in the DMA is the final word. So it will be, it will be an issue that will be discussed a lot in the, in the next future, this of the interoperability. But it's not easy to mandate interoperability in a much larger way. I, and the DMA is not doing it. By the way, even the message of interoperability, I think, was introduced by the European Parliament. It wasn't in the original uh, proposition of the DMA. So it was already a step ahead. So it's an open discussion. Uh, we didn't discuss it. It was, uh, was too soon for us, and we didn't know the DMA also was going to solve the issue. Yes, thank you. And uh, if I just can complete, I think it's really important because as you, as you showed it, uh, Pierluigi, uh, social media platforms and uh, search platforms, search engine platforms are key operators now in the media sector. So if you want to break this uh, market dominances, we, know, we need to get to interoperability. And for uh, media outlets, it's uh, very essential to, to get back the data about their users, to have a uh, a view on uh, uh, marketing and subscriptions of their future, uh, future users. So that's a very, very important uh, stake, I think. 
Just a word more. Uh, this, the last thing you said is somehow in the DMA, I, I think it will, we will see, because these are things on which uh, the commission and the platform will have to uh, find, uh, because these are not, uh, uh, as you know, the DMA has two kind of uh, um, uh, rules. Uh, some are theoretically self-applying and the others are uh, negotiated. And clearly, data sharing, uh, these kind of things that are technically complex, will be uh, will need a negotiation between the commission and the platforms. So we'll see where the negotiation goes. But however, this thing of uh, uh, data information, uh, retrieving the data about your customers used by the platform, and things like this, these are in the DMA. The interoperability I was uh, referring to was more, a more complex interoperability. For instance, the interoperability just to understand the nature of the issue, the interoperability for which each smartphone we have in our pocket works with any kind of instrument and any kind of network. Uh, think the, to this in the digital world. This means I send a message on Twitter, it goes all over to, if I have accounts on Facebook, on TikTok or whatever, and vice versa. But uh, we can do many more examples, but this is a complex world. And this is beyond, I would say, what the DMA has done for the moment. I'm not saying that it's the final world, but that's where we are. Yeah, if, if I just could uh, ask um, or probably comment the issue of uh, independence of media regulatory authorities, because I think uh, this is really important uh, for Media Freedom Act, but also uh, having regard to the future model of media governance that is to be based on some common principles, regardless whether we speak very uh, pluralistic, divided model, you know, in Europe, because in many countries we still have different uh, regulatory bodies for uh, traditional media, legacy media, like broadcasting, and different uh, for telecoms and um, uh, from, from digital platforms. Um, and um, the issue of independence is connected to these principles, I think, because um, uh, what we expect from independent media regulatory authority is uh, on the one side, uh, really impartial um, uh, decisions and also regulatory enactment, uh, but also evidence-based, which is important also for us as researchers because media regulatory authorities are using data, concrete data. And for us to actually evaluate or uh, somehow assess uh, the performance of media regulatory authorities, we need to have access to these data, which they use to, to see what are the regulatory outcomes. So um, I think the, there is some space to require these common principles for media regulators together with independence because if we have, for instance, uh, within ERGA or uh, some other structures, media regulatory authorities, which are not independent in practice, which uh, are actually controlled by the government, which uh, take regulatory decisions impacting position of uh, commercial media in some countries, like was the case in Poland last year. And one of the reasons why MPM assessment for Poland was uh, so, <laughs> bad, uh, uh, I have to say, was also uh, the decisions and activities of media regulatory authority, which is not independent. And uh, acting within the framework of ERGA, being somehow uh, legitimized as the member and um, as, as uh, some of the organization which uh, provides data that are taken seriously and, uh, you know, arguments, it, this needs some response, you know, from uh, from the European level, um, from from ERGA itself, probably as a, as a peer review form or or any other kind of uh, assessment that could point to the fact that some media regulatory agencies are not independent or decisions uh, offered by them are not independent. Just a, a short comment on, on legal basis. 
Maybe we can stress also the fact that in consideration that there are democratic elections of the European Parliament, it, EU has to ensure actually democratic media freedom and plurality to ensure actually the democratic process for the election of the European Parliament. That's another angle to, for, for the legal, legal basis. Okay, I, I think we can have a 15 minutes break. Um, be, be, if from online there are not, oh, could I say a word I can say from Renate? Yes, sure, Renate. Sure, can you, uh, maybe Renate, I'm not sure if your link allows for opening your video and audio. If not, uh, please uh, write that to us. Okay, Renate, now you should also have the authorization to open your mic. Okay. Great. Can you hear me? Thanks. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. That's much better. Yes, uh, I just want to, Renate Schroeder from the European Federation of Journalists. I first wanted to thank you for this excellent um, outline this morning and also now from Sophia regarding the U European Media Freedom Act. I think it shows there is a lot of need to regulate. And my question is, we heard from the scrutiny board that um, it must be reduced to the internal market um, framework. It seems the commission now has to redraft everything. We, together with press freedom and civil society organizations, are extremely concerned that there will maybe something very diluted coming out that would not respond to all the challenges we are facing here. And we have discussed this morning. So we would need some legal expertise in terms of how we can maybe um, discuss with the commission what is possible now within this changed um, framework? And also the question, and maybe that is a bit more political, rumor has it that some publishers are behind such a move. Um, I, I don't want to go into details here, but the question is really how can we keep our demands, which have been so well outlined by you regarding the European Media Freedom Act? Thank you. You, uh, thanks, thanks, Renate. I, I think you, yours is uh, uh, more than a shared comment than, than a real question because uh, um, I mean, and now I answer for for myself and for my experiences also for the study on the media pluralism online. Um, from a legal point of view, it's very difficult to imagine. Uh, uh, the legal strategies uh, to overcome um, some some you know uh, barriers that are uh, entangled uh, sometimes in in the treaties themselves. Uh, um, it's a question of competencies, of course, and uh, uh, I believe that um, a joint uh, force of brains uh, uh, in reasoning on on these issues that that you highlighted would be. More than welcome. Maybe this is another question to to pose uh, to the to the vice president. <laughs> if uh, um, it's dangerous, it's too dangerous. No, um, I, I see the problem. Uh, of course, I mean, our role somehow is uh, to uh, use the opportunity of uh, this uh, window uh, and uh, propose what uh, we uh, deem useful based 
exactly on uh, our our research. Uh, I see that um, I mean the, the European Union uh, uh, is very much uh, uh, I mean focused on competition. And I mean, somehow it links with the discussion we had this morning with uh, uh, Jedediah. And, uh, um, but of course, uh, uh, there is the need to uh, create somehow critical mass <laughs> in order uh, to uh, do a step forward in creating uh, a real uh, pluralistic uh, media environment. Uh, indeed, uh, a stronger cooperation can be uh, can be envisaged, uh, and uh, as much as we can, we can uh, contribute. Uh, I mean, from the, the CMPF. Oops. Okay. Okay, so thanks everybody. Thank you, Renate, uh, for intervening. Uh, so at this point, we have uh, yeah ten minutes break, and um, yeah, I, I see you in ten minutes. Bye.